Good evening, folks. Thanks for joining the first, first meetup of Elastic SF of 2024. Uh, my name is Hirani, I'm a software engineer and short wave. Uh, I'm here to talk about a little bit about AI search, how we use Elastic Search, what our experience being, and some lessons learned building a retrieval augmented generator, generation application for email. So, what is Shortwave? Shortwave is a AI for AI first email client. It is, uh, it is, you can think of it as a second interface for your Gmail account. So you sign into your Gmail, it's available on all the, all the different platforms, and you get a really powerful and rich uh, AI focused interface to get through your email. So our goal is to really make it easy for folks to get through their inbox faster with the help of AI and also reply and, and write good email using the assistance of email, uh, the assistance of AI. So uh, this is a very uh, tall one. So to get there, there are at least a couple of things we need to accomplish. One is to just have a very AI-focused production that looks at AI as a true productivity booster, not just a fun and cool novelty. And secondly, to apply AI holistically everywhere throughout our app, from compose assistance to triaging AI, and to finding critical information that's very deep down in your email history. We also provide a seamless integration with AI through our AI assistance, which is something which is an experience that you can pull in to practically any UI, any screen in the app and get contextualized app. So what does this look like in practice? Let's take a quick look. So this is my actual email, uh, email inbox at work. Uh, let's get through a few emails and see what's up. So first there's this email about IFA behaviors. I know our team's been working really hard on a bunch of upcoming releases, but I've lost some context here. I don't really know what this email is about. I'm just gonna ask my assistant. is hard. All right, so now the AI is reminding me, IFA actually means in-app feature announcement. Okay, now it's trying to start to page into me. This is one of the features in our app. Whenever we ship a new feature, we have the ability to push notifications into the app itself and tell users about newly launched features. And we did a bunch of changes uh, about around how IFAs are displayed in the app. Now, this is still a very long thread, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, so I'm just going to ask the AI to uh, just summarize it. And it gives me a nice little bullet point summary of what's going email, uh, which is great. And now it looks like, so this is obviously related to some of the releases that are uh, that we are currently working on. And one of them is an AI assistant experience for iOS. So today's assistant experience you are seeing is only available on web. On iOS, it's gonna be launched very soon. So uh, one of the problems that we've been working on is what is the right way to launch the assistant in iOS? So in web, you have a lot of screen space, you can put a lot of buttons and controls. But I, in an iOS, it's more, in an iOS app, it's more natural to have some kind of a gesture to pull this up. And I know this is a problem that our guys are working on. So I'm gonna just ask where I need this. What did we decide on AI assistant gesture for iOS? So it's trying to answer on the board and failing. So I'm going to just ask him to go and look at my emails. So 
database, looking at the relevant emails, going through my entire email history, and trying to find the right answer. All right, so it looks like we decided on a wave gesture in the total wave. Uh, so it looks like doing a wave gesture is going to pull out the AI assistant uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the iOS app. And it also points me, give me a link to the exact email that I have where I pulled the answer from and a couple of other related threads that is pulled up uh, in the process. Uh, also, let's go ahead and ask some other, let's go ahead and go ahead and look at some other emails that I've received. Let's look at this one. So this is somebody asking to meet me next week at the office. Uh, and they've gotten the office address. So I'm going to just tell, tell the AI to reply. And then indeed, the our office address is pulling it from my email, uh, email history. And it's also trying to mimic my style. I usually write a lot of short, I prefer to write very short emails, one-liners, two-liners, and I don't usually use a greeting or a, or a sign or signature. So it's following my style and also predicting the exact content that I would have written to revive this style. Uh, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's, let's ask some other random questions. Uh, uh, let's ask some questions about this event. Let's ask uh, who's coordinating the last big meetup. So, again, it's looking at my email history, and it's found out that the event is being organized by Olivia, who's, who's the person that I've been in touch with. And it points me to the emails, uh, email conversations that Olivia and I had. Uh, we also, uh, at Shortly, we have a lot of uh, periodic offsites. We just finished one in uh, San Diego a couple of weeks ago, so I'll ask some questions about that. Again, going through the email, thinking, and coming up with the right uh, screen address that looks about right. Uh, let's ask, where uh, did we go for dinner in San Diego? And it pulls up the right restaurant information. Let's see. Let's say, what other fun things did we do in San Diego? All right. So, so yeah, yeah, we did indeed uh, spend some time in in the San Diego Zoo. Uh, Some of this is old, but well, let's see. Let's see if we can get a more recent answer. All right. We did indeed have a chocolate making night hosted by Chocolate Here Demand, sitting in there. <laughs> Uh, and we had a game night, we had a team activity in San Diego. Uh, so this, this looks all good. So uh, this is what our AI assistant experience looks like. It has a lot of visibility and access to your email history, your calendars, uh, some information about short views, uh, help docs itself, and it can Pull in the right context to answer a wide range of questions uh, and, and help you 
sort of get through uh, your questions and, and whatever the task you are trying to achieve uh, uh, very quickly. So let's go back to slides and, and see how this is kind of. So first, some requirements and constraints that we had to deal with. Uh, even from like day one, we've been working at this for about a year now, and from day one, we knew that we want the assistant to be able to answer pretty much any question. Could be questions about your more recent emails, past emails, general knowledge type questions, uh, other random tasks about around your calendar, replying to emails, uh, summarization requests, pretty much anything. Maybe not at first, but eventually we want to get there. Uh, now, the typical way this kind of thing is designed is using long LLM call chains. However, we took a slightly different approach because we found long LLM call chains to be both slow and error prone. Specifically, they suffer from a problem called the compounding error effect. This is when one earlier step in the LLM call chain makes an error, feeds it into the next step, and it's multiplied multiply through across the chain and you get a completely uh, wrong and incorrect answer at the end. So we want to avoid that. And also another kind of observation we made was that LLM capabilities, they, are, they continue to improve year over year at a very rapid rate. Their context windows have expanded, their latencies have gone down. So they are really becoming capable of handling a large amount of information in one API call and giving you uh, useful and correct answers. So we wanted to kind of leverage that. And apart from that, we wanted to have some kind of a modular design so that our engineers can reason about the AI interactions easily and also for us to easily extend by adding new capabilities over time. So to meet those requirements, we came up with this sort of four-tiered architecture. And kind of the key point in this architecture is this abstraction called tools. They are, you can think of them as different sources of information that feeds into our AI system. So when, when a user query comes in, the AI assistant looks at the query and decides what are the most appropriate tools that can be used to answer that question. And then it executes them, usually in parallel. Each tool does some computation, does some I.O. work, does some database lookup, does some elastic search lookups, and find a whole bunch of information. And all that information actually gets pumped into one single prompt uh, with some conditions, uh, and then gets shipped off to an LLM to reason about. And then you finally get the answer, and we do a little bit of post-processing. Uh, like we might place some references and links into the answer. We might do some markdown processing on, on the answer uh, uh, during the rendering time so it looks nicer. Uh, and that's one in the post processing. So this is a high level architecture uh, of what's going on. So, so what are these tools and what does tool selection actually mean? So right now we have about seven, eight different tools. We have a calendar tool that gives the assistant access to uh, if I use this Google Calendar, we have a summarized tool that does uh, really good information dense summaries on emails. We have a compose tool that can write emails that mimic user style very closely. Uh, we have a current thread and current draft tools that give access to uh, whatever the uh, thread or the, or the draft the user has open on their screen. So the AI assistant is aware of what the user is currently doing within the app. There's a short wave help tool that allows the assistant to reason about how to achieve certain tasks within short wave. Uh, and then there's perhaps a more sophisticated tool, AI search, which is how the assistant gains access to the user's email quotes. So when, when you ask a question like summarize this or reply like I've done in the past, we first use an uh, LLM call to determine what are the most appropriate set of tools uh, that are necessary to answer that question. So for like, like summarize this. So this obviously means what I'm looking at in the screen and the AI understands this and correctly selects the current thread tool. And reply like I've done in the past, it's more complicated. It needs to 
First look at the thread the user is currently looking at. It needs to use AI search to pull up past emails and then use Compose to write a reply. Uh, so this all happens under the hood. This is an AI interaction that's happening sort of out of the view of the user, but still uh, happening deep within our stack. So let's talk a little bit about AI search tool because this is, this is like I said, our most uh, sophisticated tool uh, to the, uh, today. This is what allows the AI assistant to look up and reference user's email history. Uh, it's, it's job, it's kind of simple. You give it a question and its job is to find the most relevant email threads uh, to that question. But unfortunately, email data is such that this makes this problem so much harder. For one thing, email data could be very large, depending on how long you had that email account, you might have tens of thousands of emails. And it's a growing data set, because you every day you ingest some number of emails. It's also a very low signal, high noise. We've seen that about two thirds of your email are like promotions and updates and all other kinds of spam. So there's very little high value emails in your e inbox. And there's a lot of content diversity. There's content like plain text, markdown, HTML, multimedia, all sort of content, and a lot of metadata cardinality. Every email has a bunch of headers, like two CC, BCC recipients, subject, timestamp. All this information is kind of useful uh, or should be looked at when giving, uh, when coming up with an answer for a question. So to sort of deal with this complexity, we devised this five-step retrieval pipeline. The first step is called query reformulation. This is making sure that we've interpreted the user's question correctly. Like take this particular interaction, for example. So I started by asking, uh, what was Jacob's feedback about, uh, about something, about feedback on auto summaries? And then it gives me an answer. And then I ask, how about Johnny? Now I'm obviously asking what was Johnny's feedback about the same project, but it is not explicitly stated in the question. So if I just feed in the question, how about Johnny, to whatever the retrieval pipeline, you get a bunch of random nonsense back. So that question only makes sense in the larger context of the conversation and needs to be interpreted that way. So this is where query reformulation comes in. So this is another application of an LLM where we take the conversation history and also some other context information, like sometimes it could be what the, the thread the user is currently looking at, all that information, and kind of rewrite the user's question to be a self-contained and, and, uh, and sensible. So for example, the first question, how about Johnny, could get rewritten to something like, what was Johnny's feedback on auto summaries? Now that's a question we can send to a retrieval pipeline to pull in uh, more uh, pull in relevant context on. Next, we take the rewritten query and run it through a series of AI and LLM prompts to extract various features out of it. We specifically look for any date ranges, names of people, any email labels that I explicitly reference, any email addresses, other keywords, and recency bias information that's present in the email. Uh, all this information get extracted at, uh, at this stage. So given a question like, what did Alex work on yesterday? The LLM could look, look at it and say, okay, this question, the keywords are work and yesterday, uh, and the name that it extracted might say, oh, this question mentions Alex, and it could determine a date range extractor relative to current time. Uh, it could also run it through an embedding model to extract some query embeddings, Recency bias extractor basically assigns a score based on how recent uh, the query is related or how recent e information you should pull up to answer this question. Since we're asking for a question about yesterday, so that it could rate it very high. We also, for every feature we extract, we also assign confidence scores, uh, which uh, we realized that helps the LLM itself to reason about its answer using the score. And also we use this course later uh, to, to further re-rank the results. 
So once we have the features, we actually turn them into a bunch of Elasticsearch queries and fire away at our Elasticsearch cluster. So we at Shortwave use Elasticsearch, uh, have been using for years. It's what powers our uh, email search functionality. We use the same infrastructure to serve these queries. So we take things like date range, keywords, all that, turns into subqueries, gets executed in parallel uh, on our Elasticsearch cluster. However, full text search and metadata queries like queries on dates and names alone are not always enough. Sometimes you need to go a bit deep. For example, take a question like, what open source LLMs did we experiment with? Now, I do happen to have a bunch of emails in my inbox that mention that, that could answer this question, but they, I don't think any of them actually explicitly mention open source Anyway, they just reference the models by their name, Mistral, Zephyr, or whatever. So a simple keyword search query will not necessarily pull those emails up. We need some, some agent, some, some search component that understands the semantics of the query and the documents and pull in the relevant context. So this is achieved with semantic search. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how this is done. But the... The basic recipe is always the same as you have an embedding model that embeds all your documents into, an, uh, into a vector space. In our case, we use an open source model called Instructor. Uh, all the vectors get stored in a vector database that's optimized to, uh, to pull uh, vectors uh, or run vector similarity queries. Uh, we don't use Elasticsearch for this particular workload today, but but this is something that's supported in, in the more recent versions of Plastic and say now our roadmap to evaluate that at some point. Uh, and once you have this infrastructure, given input query, you can embed this query using the same model and run a similarity search and pull in semantically relevant content. So we do the, this as another step. Uh, and we also use some of the metadata features we've extracted, things like date range, to further narrow down our search. We in fact, we learned that date range plus uh, semantic search is one of the most effective ways we have to find relevant context. Now, running all these elastic queries and then uh, semantic search queries can yield thousands of hits. That's, that's a lot of information. For one thing, we can't realistically stuff all that into a prompt. Uh, and and to be honest, like most of the, those content are only like only marginally related. So we need to really filter this down to just a handful. So we do this in, in a couple of different steps. In the first step, we do apply some heuristics to go from about thousands of documents to about a couple of hundred. And then we apply something called a cross encoder to go from hundred, hundreds of results down to about 10. So, uh, in the first step, the heuristic re-ranking phase, we basically take what's called a buy encoder approach. We take the semantic similarity score of all the results we've, uh, we've received, and we just use it as a kind of a simple ranking function, and then apply a series of boosts and penalties to make some adjustments around. And this is what that looks like. So if, if we extracted a date range earlier in our feature extraction step, then emails that happen to fall within that date range get a slight boost, and the other emails get a lesser boost. Uh, and emails that mention the names and labels we've extracted, they get a boost. If there was a recency bias, more recent emails get a boost. We also deprioritize promotions and updates in most cases, unless the user has explicitly asked not to. Uh, and also the size of the, of the, so the magnitude of this boost or the penalty is tied to the confidence scores we extracted earlier. So if we extracted a date range with very high, high confidence, then we can afford to give it a very high, uh, very high boost, uh, as opposed to if it's a low confidence, maybe not so much. Also, we don't apply flat boosts in many cases, like as shown in the, in the graph here. Uh, so we've extracted a date range we just, instead of giving all the emails in that date range a flat boost, we apply this sort of Gaussian curve so that things that fit, uh, fit well into that range get a higher boost. 
And also the emails that are outside that range also get a slight boost and not, don't get completely left behind. So that's the first step of ranking. So we rank and extract first couple of hundred results and then ship it off to something called a cross encoder. This is another machine learning model that if you haven't worked with the cross encoder, this is what they kind of look like. They basically take pairs of questions and paragraphs uh, as the input. So in this case, the question is the same. How many people live in Berlin? And these are potential paragraphs that could answer the question. So this paragraph clearly answers it. This one doesn't. And it looks at all this information and basically spits out uh, two scores. So since the first document answers it, it gets a very high score. And the second one gets a lower score. These are log probability values and you can convert them into probabilities uh, if you want. And that's basically what a cross encoder does. Uh, it's a very smart process, but it's also very slow. So you really need to apply some kind of pre-filtering before you get here and really, because uh, you can't really realistically afford to do this on thousands and, and not be very slow. And it also requires some serious GPU acceleration. Uh, so we actually have a cluster of GPUs serving this workload for us. And uh, at the end of this, you get an ordered set of documents and that, what uh, gets shipped off to an LLM to reason about and come up with the answer. So this is what the final architecture looks like. So you're starting with the row query, goes through query formulation, feature extraction, and some elastic queries, the semantic search step, our heuristic re-ranking, cross encoder re-ranking, and you finally have the ordered thread fragments. This process end to end have multiple LLM calls, um, some ML model invocations, some elastic queries, some vector search queries. Uh, regardless, we we figured out how to do this whole thing end to end in about three seconds for most queries, like you saw uh, during the demo. Uh, it took a lot of stream uh, like streaming, pipelining, and batch processing to make it work. Uh, yeah. A lot of our backend implementation is in Kotlin, and we make heavy use of Kotlin core team. Uh, and close to make this happen. And also just good old fashioned GPU acceleration uh, uh, where necessary. Now, of course, I haven't talked much about the right-hand side of the image where, uh, uh, where all the indexing and ingestion work happens. Basically to run this pipeline, you first need to have infra where you ingest and index all this information beforehand. But I'll talk a little bit about that real quick. So like I said, we've been using Elastic for several years. It's what powers our email search functionality. So if you go to a UI and do a search like this, so in this case, I'm searching for emails from Sophia with the word blog. Uh, we support the Gmail query language in our app as well. So you can use operators like from, and you get a bunch of results back, uh, just like Gmail does, and it's all powered by Elastic under the hood. And we get a lot, from Elastic to make this work. We get stemming, uh, which is uh, when you search for a word, word like blog, stemming will also look for other similar words like blogger and blogging uh, and pull them into the results. Uh, you can see there's some highlighting going on there with the uh, with hits. Uh, results are time ordered like Gmail does. And it also supports multiple languages. You can search, you can write queries in like Chinese characters, for example, and it will match, uh, uh, match the right documents. All this we get from Elastic, which means we have to obviously index all the emails we pull in yeah, into Elastic. Uh, we, we version control our index schema. Right now it's set v12, which means we've gone through 12 iterations of updating our schema over time. In each iteration, we've added, removed, or updated fields, changed how elastic analyzers and tokenizers are configured, uh, done a lot of work there. We also built quite a bit of infra and tooling to make it easy for us to add to basically version control and, and evolve this index over time. So for example, if you wanted to go from add a new field or add a new analyzer into our analyzer chain, we would define the new index schema as version 13. We'll re-index some portion of our emails. 
usually just the internal email traffic into that index, uh, test it for a while, uh, and then run a job to basically re-index everything we uh, ingested up to that point. And during this period, we can actually serve traffic from both indexes uh, based on how far into the, into the re-indexing process we are. And I mean, when, when, when the new index has fully caught up, we can just leave the old one. Uh, we have a similar, very similar infra for vector databases. In fact, uses sort of the same code. Uh, the only two exceptions are vector searches created by uh, our payment plans. So it's only available for paid users. And we also tie the, the history length of the, uh, of the vector ingestion to users' uh, payment here. Uh, and also we namespace uh vectors by the user this was kind of a key requirement for us from day one because a lot of these vector databases use this uh type of index called hnsw under the hood i think elastic is the same like the new versions of elastic uh stands for hierarchical navigable small world if you want to look it up it's a very uh, impressive technology that makes vector search really fast and efficient, but an unfortunate uh, consequence is that they kind of degrade in both performance and search quality when they grow very big. So we really need to partition this out by the user and keep them kind of uh, manageably small. Uh, like I said earlier, we use Instructor as our embedded model and it's run for ingestion workloads. We run it on a separate cluster with low end GPUs. So all this work happens in the background. It's not user visible latency, so it's not a problem. So you can just run it on a bunch of cheap, uh, low end GPUs. So I'm going to finish off with some lessons learned. Uh, first off, about retrieval. Uh, if you're building an experience like this so using AI and LLMs, experiment with different content formats and chunking schemes, and you might have to do this at different levels of your uh, of your retrieval augmentation uh, stack. Because what the format that works well for embeddings might not work well for the cross encoder, might not work well for the prompts. So you'll have to write a lot of code to kind of juggle these different formats and, and chunking schemes. It's so unfortunate, but if you can if you can get it right, the results are actually kind of night and day. Also, re-ranking is very essential to make this work. We did have a time where I didn't have re-ranking re in our architecture, and adding that actually made a whole bunch of problems just go away and, and significantly improve the search quality of AI Assistant. Uh, today we do we're doing relatively simple things like by encoders and cross encoders, but there are more sophisticated tech like Colbert coming into uh, uh, coming into general use now. Uh, in fact, it's in our roadmap to uh, to integrate with some of these new tech as well. Uh, also, combining semantic search with classic full text search is a, it's a very powerful recipe. There are very there are several different ways you can do this. There's something called hybrid search, which is kind of the official way of supporting this. It's something that's natively supported in Elastic, but you can also kind of do a poor man's approximation of it, like we did. Uh, there are also sparse retrieval methods. Uh, Elastic Search has something called Elser, which looks very interesting. Uh, and also, a good retrieval implementation can unlock a bunch of other use cases. Like we originally built it just to answer questions, but now we use the same tech in our, what we call the ghostwriter feature, where the AI can pretty accurately determine or predict both your style and the content of the emails you can write. Also as a preview of something we are currently working on, I go to the same email and start a reply. You can see the edges suggests what I should reply with, and I can just do it auto completion. Uh, it's a feature that we are currently working on, and uses the same AI search infrastructure under the hood to make this happen. So LLMs are kind of this strange, unpredictable thing that's kind of unleashed upon us. Uh, as an engineer, I kind of have this weird love-hate relationship with. 
with it. It's very powerful when it, when it works. It's like magic, but it's also like gives very few guarantees to you. Like as an engineer, like we are used to APIs and systems like giving you strong guarantees, and provable guarantees, and you get not that. Um, and on top of that, there's in the data in the old database world, there was this cap theorem of uh, uh, trade-offs, consistency, availability, and arch intolerance. Select two. I think there's a similar thing with LLMs, which is cost fees, like how much money you are willing to spend per token accuracy, which comes down to its reasoning capability and come up with good answers and performance. And you can most of the time you can have two. Uh, you have to usually trade off one to get the other two. So pick your, you know, consider your trade-offs carefully and, and pick your poison. Uh, also spend some time optimizing prompts. Prompt engineering does work, but it does hit a, hit a ceiling very, very soon. And when you see diminishing results, you should just move on and try to gain ground somewhere else. Because otherwise prompt engineering can be a bit of a bottomless pit. Uh, and be very principled about how you structure prompts. It helps you to, it, A, it forces you to write good structured code that builds prompts by combining lots of different contexts. And it also helps, we've seen this, that it helps the model like to reason better when you have everything nicely structured. But whatever you do, always expect the unexpected. No matter how well you structure your prompt, the AI can still hallucinate, it can still provide answers that are not in the right format. So you need to be lenient around handling that kind of bad outcomes. And some other engineering lessons we learned. Um, AI is obviously a very fast evolving field. A uh, lot of the things we've done over the year, like looking back, seems like there are like better alternatives we can be doing right now. So choose your tech very carefully. Uh, Self-hosted open source models, they, they, they are getting really good and can save you a lot of money and also better for privacy if you apply correctly. Uh, also, things like fine tuning, even sometimes even on a small data set, like a couple of hundred data points, can sometimes yield huge gains. Uh, and this is very important. Build infrastructure to collect this data, evaluate things in isolation. Uh, even a small, like I say, even a small test data set can, and a couple of metrics can go a long way uh, towards making rapid progress as opposed to just operating completely in the dark. Uh, in in short way, we build tools like so. There's a provide feedback option that's tied to everything that's uh, always uh, right here. The assistant and users can just click this and provide us some debug logs and information about their interactions, which they often do, which we find very useful. Also, uh, as engineers, like so, this is like a special debug info that's available only for certain accounts. Uh, this. Uh, provides more debug uh, debug level visibility. And also you can see there's a copy request as JSON. So it basically exports a JSON snapshot of the entire interaction. And then we have built tools where we can import that JSON file and run that interaction in isolation for testing. It's been very helpful to, uh, to debug things. Uh, and finally, uh, just note that there are like a lot of tutorials out there about how to take how to turn your data into into a rag or Q and A bot, uh, and they do work, and they will get you about 70, 80 percent of the way towards a kind of a working solution. But the last 20, 30 percent is where the real work is. It will be like months of work, months of testing and iterating to get to a real production ready uh, uh, AI AI implementation. So there's going to be a lot of development cycles and iterations. So you invest some time to make that cycle really fast and efficient for you. Uh, instrument the systems. You have full operational visibility in testing. Might not be able to do this in production environments. In those cases, make it easy for users to submit feedback. And also spend some time looking at performance. When we first built our AI search, it was about 15 to 20 seconds per query. We brought it down to three to five seconds. It was the weeks of hunting down bottlenecks. 
it's sometimes when working with AI, it's easier to think, oh, it's LLM, they are slow, your implementation's gonna be slow, but sometimes you'll, you'll get surprised. Um, so that's all I had to share. Uh, check us out at shortwave.com if you're in the market for a new Gmail experience. Uh, we are also next week, we are doing a bunch of AI launches. In fact, the plan is to launch a new AI feature every day for the entire week. So check us out. All right. I'm, uh, my name is Tristan. I'm a senior student architect here at Elastic. And what I'll be presenting today very quickly is a kind of high level look at our new query language. So we're calling uh, ESQL. Uh, the pipe is in the middle. Uh, it's silent. It's more for uh, documentation purposes. Because for those of you who remember, Elastic had a. Oh, version of SQL. Can everyone hear me? Hello? All right. Uh, so I lost a kind of pretty SQL a little ways ago. So this is just for uh, marketing purposes. All right. So, so real quick on the agenda, we're going to go through what query languages, some basic query syntaxes, and then I'll show you all what it actually means um, in an actual line up with Carmen. So, so quick show of hands. Anyone familiar with this? Yeah. Any huge fans of it? Yeah. It's, it does look up. There we go. See, we have one there. There's a learning curve. It's extremely powerful and things of that nature. Um, but one thing um, that's always been interesting is how to do some different kind of aggregation on the fly via a period of time, right? Without having to go over the syntax. So, real quickly, what is ESQL? So, it is our new type oriented language um, that runs on a brand new query engine uh, that transforms and bridges. Y'all can read the section here. But effectively, it's a new kind of query language for us that relies on a new query engine. Now, this doesn't mean there's any change to last query itself. Still run your data nodes, your master nodes, all that. It's just underlying code change uh, that was most recently introduced in our version 8.11 um, and now in 8.12, which is our latest. Um, we have some improvements to it. It is still tech review, though, as a practice to all of this, um, but we're actively working to bring it to GA. So, what it actually consists of? It consists of that gentleman in the back, Austin, and his team with about 17 months of yeah. The gap behind about 17 months worth of development. So, something we put significant time in and plan to continue doing moving forward. And um, I will share the slides on in case anyone's curious about the commit, but that's more of a nerd fandom point. Lastly, um, biggest difference there is going to be a new endpoint. So, everyone's familiar with underscore search. We now have underscore query. This is a query engine. A lot of different aspects to it in terms of why it's performant. If you're really interested in the nuts and bolts, all of this is out in our GitHub and also in. Behind this, right behind you. So we'll skip over that part, but we'll show some of the benchmarking that we're seeing. So the example here on the bottom left is just a very simple aggregation query just on an integer with sorting. Um, and as you can see, so I'm going to zoom in just a smidge. So this is on our 90 benchmark. Ooh, that was weird. This is on our 90 benchmark on the left. So as you can see, our traditional search aggregation, which is the query is all here in the beginning, ranges quite high here. Um, and then ESQL, as you can see, dramatically different from a performance standpoint. And again, only difference is slightly different query syntax, you have brain elastic, no underlying hardware changes need to be made. All right, so we're gonna go into an example um, here. I'll adjust for Zoom. So very quickly, this is just, for those of you not just in the security background, this is just a potential attack vector um, that come in. And what we're gonna use here is we're gonna translate how it could potentially detect against this kind of vulnerability what the SQL. It's going to be a nice long query. And we're going to break it down by section. So this is what it looks like from the ESQL standpoint, right? Um, nice and long. We're going to go through each of the components and then I'll flip over to an actual example. So the first line from very simple. For those of you who are used to Elastic, it's very similar to defining what data pattern you want to go after. So for us, this supports indices, data streams, aliases, wild cards, whatever have you. You're simply just saying where you want to grab data from. So in this case, right, if you just from, it pulls our references. Where, very similar to any kind of RDMS, simply defining a condition. So again, same concept. Stats and by. So this is when you want to do any kind of fun math, stats and by are going to be your rest. So as an example from here, if we simply do a stats and do a count on this event output and yield, we get this value. But if we break down by by, yeah, right now we just have nothing, you know, overly different from uh, traditional RDMS here from the syntax standpoint. And then again, um, you can buy by many fields, but again, word matters, right? So if you switch host to username, you're going to get a very different table that comes out. Ooh, email. Another one. So those of you real quick, 
how much show show fans, how many people were ever just on the girl last week and really wanted a new fan to show up because you know exactly what the competition would be, but you couldn't do it, you just had to read the next every Nobody? Great. Ah, no, they already might do it. All right, so this is another way to kind of potentially get around one of those dish blocks, right? So rather than having to re-index anything, we use something like ping script or runtime fields, I can simply define a new field, height underscore inches, say multiply by one of my fields, and you can use it moving forward uh, with your other queries. So again, extra easier analysis um, moving forward. Value and then keep. Keep is a little different from those of you who use query yourself. Traditionally, when you pull it, you get all the fields. Right, and whether you want it or not, you get all this. Key blocks you just specify which fields you actually want to see in the final result. So again, more pruning and just all back limited, so you can kind of see it as it builds as you kind of solve in the previous query. And rename, same concept, right? So anyone use the elastic column schema for any reason? No, it is maybe. All right, got one back. All right, so elastic common schema is our defined schema for our server-related security solutions. We map a whole bunch of fields to have common names across the application to make it easier to correlate data. The problem is sometimes some of those fields look like destination.geo.region.name, not the most attractive name in the world. So if you go ahead and use rename, very simple, just rename the fields on the fly. And again, this is not, there's no re-index, nothing like that. It's all just that query type. Sort. Pretty much what it says it does, sort of my first name, things of that nature. But again, you can also use sort for things like eval you can find if you feel and look at that in a second. And then lastly, this is a little, this is pretty much a lot, um, but it's our quick reference guide. And there's a QR code here at the bottom right in case anyone wants to grab it. Uh, but this will evolve as we also evolve language. And I mentioned more commands, different kind of functionality, but this is just a nice quick GG. All right, so enough slide around. Let's see what it actually is. So, this is on our public demo site. So demo.lastup.co, and I want to take a look at it. Go ahead and pull it up. So let's go ahead and do this. So let's do this is an interesting position. All right, so a couple things. You have a query. The most importantly, and this is the nice advancement and why we felt the need to go and develop a brand new feature for it. We're also creating visualization on the fly. So for those of you familiar, in the old with Elastic, right? You have to come here, go to visualize, create visualization, all that. You couldn't do this all within, within the discovery. So this is what we're doing, trying to bring the analysis all together, right? So I go ahead and find a view here, and then this is completely editable on the right. And the other nice thing, and I'll show here in a moment, is if you have right permissions, which I don't in this demo environment, you can also save these visualizations to be used in other dashboards as well. So everything can be done right from the discover, how you query, find the information you're interested in, and you can go ahead and stack it there. So to break down the screen, we're pulling from our next pods, simply where our data set equals the next pod, and we're simply asking, we're defining a new uh, stats aggregation here, very similar to if you use query DSL, you have to find the ag and then say what ag you wanted. Similar here, you can find the ag as an max CPU, follow the max of it, order by unit, uh, order by volume, and then as I mentioned, right, you can now use this aggregation as a sort, right? This field never existed prior to the query. You can now do it here as well. So that's another thing to kind of point out. It's all type oriented. So order doesn't matter where you put this, right? Uh, but again, it does make it easier to do troubleshooting and things like that. And for those of you who are more used to high oriented languages like Slunk, SPL, uh, Custo for Azure, and then CloudWatch, uh, AWS, all similar concepts. Um, and then the next thing as well, this is also pulled very cleanly into an order. Right, so if you want to go ahead and make things like you know base thresholds off of variety of conditions, this is where it translates very nicely. And if my zoom wasn't horrible, this would look a little cleaner. Um, but from here, you can set the time window you want to learn that, and you can also run this as well based on the time condition. So again, before you start firing a bunch of queries, again, your last cluster may or may not return what you want. You can go in and test for you actually push your so I've been talking for a lot, and I have many other examples we can go through. Um, but any questions now? Right. In this example, sure. it's a straight query. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming, not assuming, asking. Yeah. Uh, could you do subqueries? I mean, like a query within a query. Yeah. So let's actually look at that. Um, so it depends how you mean. So there will be some advancements where you can do more aggregations with the uh, within one another. However, do you have any rooms? So, 
So this sample, little, you know what? So this is DevTools, not tonight, but just show me how to So you can, you can chain an aggregation. That's Let me hear the word. Um, source. Uh, oh, here's an example. Sorry. Uh, so this is this is an example, right? So we're running stats average duration here, and then we're going ahead and doing the max of that average duration. So I don't know if that's what you meant by subquery, but that's, that's two froms, a from within a from. That's a good question. Awesome. You, not at the moment. Great. But not at the moment. However, what you can do, and I'm not sure if that's just for you, you can. No, I'm. You can, anybody can hear me? Can I can. I have a built-in mic. So you can actually chain and query DSL. I'm not sure if that's uh, related to what you're asking. We can have, if you have a query DSL and you want to use ESQL, you can actually chain the query DSL as a filter or a pre filter, and then run the ESQL on top on the results of that filter. I see. And that's actually what you see there in Tibana. So in Tibana, essentially what, what you do, you see you run your query, but when you use the time picker, essentially you select the range a query DSL that essentially gets fed the final query. All right. I think you can mix and match. You don't have to pick one or the other. You can use them together. But subqueries are, are on the roadmap. Somewhere. Yeah, that's why I feel. Check it. Other joins. <laughs> <laughs> I just whispered away. <laughs> <laughs> I think that took about 10 minutes to get there. We're we're getting there, slowly for Some things with joins we got to think about, like cross cluster search. And, yeah. However, for joins, we do have them rich. Yeah. I'm not sure if. Yeah, yeah. but still. Yeah, yeah I do. Oh, sorry. So, um, rich is similar. Uh, if you're familiar, Elasticsearch support what is called an enrich index. Actually, you know what? Let me just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to. That took 10 minutes longer than that. <laughs> so, uh, Elasticsearch support what is called an enrich index. So the difference between uh, a join and an enrich index is uh, a join essentially happens between any two tables and you join them on the fly. Enrich index essentially, because we're a distributed uh, system, is a prepared, um, it's a prepared uh, index of sorts, where essentially you de describe a policy. For those that are unfamiliar, you describe a policy, what is called an enrich policy. And as your data flies in or comes into the system and is ingested, um, the enrich, an enrich table is being created. And we can use that essentially, as shown on the slide mm -hmm. essentially, to do at runtime dynamic joins between that enrich table, which contains the metadata between what information essentially has to be looked and your data, which goes beyond what enrich does. So essentially you can think of it as a join between a dedicated table and whatever an arbitrary table. So instead of being two tables or two indices in our case, it would be a prepared index and any type of index that you want. And is it physical? Is it like a materialized view? No, it's not a materialized view. It's a, everything is on the fly. So what I mean by that is just because there are different terms that have different meanings. A view typically means that you save it somewhere and then either is dynamic or every time you it does uh, uh, the query or materialized meaning that it's saved and then it's stored. It's not, it's not a view. We're also working on a view at some point, but right now essentially it's just the query. So it, it's as if, would be a transparent view that it's only leave, lives while you're doing the query, but it's, it's done on the fly, meaning that it's not going to be saved somewhere, at least at this point. So that gets you kind of halfway there to a join. And we can actually see an example, actually. That would be great, yes. So I don't have to keep waving. We'll be talking about really join. All right, so let's do, sorry, John, I don't think I got that. I can discover. Yes, I think we should, should have a rich path. All right, so yep. Yep. All right. So, this, so this can be an example here. So what it's doing, right? So this server project is your rich policy as we saw kind of over here. So that's this portion over here. And then on the project ID with the name. So effectively it's enriching, um, yeah. it's gone ahead and pull. Uh, the project name, I believe, and add a couple. Um, you can actually have, sorry, that example. So, this. Oh, here's 
So um, real quick, just kind of break it down. As I mentioned, this is the enrich policy. So you run it, it basically tells you, right, it's matching on the client IP field, enriching on the environment. Again, just this is the raw data itself, right? We just have client IPs environment. And then using this, right, we're going to keep the timestamp and duration, same fields, evaluate. We can actually go ahead and run it to rich. So just to answer the question earlier, right, it's not right, it's attack query time, things of that nature, but again, you can call it all and define the policy at the time. So that's what kind of stays put in a way, right? Just the logic itself. And then this is another example where you can actually run and enrich, right? We went and did the same thing, added the environment. And now we went, we went ahead and did the buy down here, breaking it down by something we didn't have in the original data set, and then going ahead and do an aggregation on top. So not the best view because it's not all pretty visualizations, but hopefully the logic will persist. So here's one thing. Uh, maybe how about you run the query the first three? So you would run prompt keep eval, mm -hmm. essentially comment this one out, and then add each by once at a time, and then essentially run it so people can maybe see what's going on. Uh, all right, all right. So essentially what, what you see here is we get the data, we do a projection that what that keep does, and then we do the evaluation. So eval essentially is going to say, I'm going to add this particular field at the, at the end of the other fields. Now, the nice thing about the pipes, you can add as many as you want and you can order them. Now, obviously, the order is important, but behind the scene, we figure out that, okay, actually, we can rearrange and optimize it. So you don't have to worry about it. But <laughs> again, there, there are some, some meanings to it. So now if, if we do add the eval, uh, sorry, the enrich, so rich essentially, see the table there? Now it's going to be essentially expanded because essentially we're doing joining by doing the environment there. So that enrich says the data that you currently have, I'm going to enrich that on what? Using the client policy. And I'm going to also specify the field name. That's something that we, we do here because typically it's built in, but actually we can change that dynamically. That's something that goes beyond the client IP policy. And we also tell you the fields that with, because you're, policy table or um, the enrich table might have, let's say five fields or 10 fields, and you just want to pick one or two. And here you can specify what you want. By default, we're going to pick everything. And also you can also specify an alias in case you have a class. So let's say you have field A, you enrich with the enrich table that also field A is going to be a match. So you can say, you know what, take that A and put it as B. So then you're going to have A and B, but that value is going to be here. And the important thing is that enrich table is not going to be touched. What you see here is just your query results. And now if you, if you do the, uh, whatever it was, the user stats, that's essentially it's grouped. So it says, now I'm gonna take that output from enrich, which doesn't exist anywhere. Again, it's just in this query and I'm gonna do a group by M. And M by essentially was taken from the enrich table. And I'm gonna compute the median of event duration, which uh, is um, essentially the a field that already exists that moves through the enrichment. And does the enrich behave like an inner join, outer join, can you pick? Uh, it, that's the thing because it's it's essentially a left join because the so if you look at the enrich table, it, um, we do the map on the field and essentially we we take that table and we put it on what's currently here. So it's still going to be the. So uh, if didn't find anything. There'll be a no. no yeah, no. essentially it's going to say uh, the columns on the left hand side exist, but there was nothing on the right hand side. So okay. those are going to be that it was not. In a way, it's a lookup. In a way, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lookup it depends on the terminology. Yeah. If you're referring yeah, yeah. to the racial database, your friends yeah. joins, yeah, if of for like some spawn or custom. And, and can that enrich be composite? Like can I enrich and concatenate with other things, or is it a one-to-one? -one, like when you say many things. Well, if if I want to make it composite a composite field or or a field that column so is you, enriched from different places, so I can yes. have a composite. Yes. String. The way you would do it is you would do it in stages. So you, what I mean by that is the, the field is dynamic in this query. So you can do an eval on the fly. Yeah. And then you can enrich that field that you created here. But the policy itself, that field is static. That's the okay. uh, kind of, if you want to say the, the, the reference. Yeah, the reference or the limitations of a rich. Yeah. So as long as I have on the other side a value and a field that matches, yeah. here I can have whatever dynamic thing. And actually you can do multiple enriches. So you can take your thing and say, now I'm going to enrich it with the IP, and then I'm going to do some filtering, and then I'm going to enrich with an IO table, which might be countries or whatever have you, whatever typically the lookups you have. And that's common in security where you essentially expand the data. 
obviously for performance reasons, typically you want to do the lookup when you have less data, just because it's expensive. Now, one thing that we're currently looking at and it's going to be in the next version is going to be doing enrichment over remote clusters. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, different regions and you have different cluster remote clusters, if folks are familiar with close cluster search, essentially that lookup table is, can be local. So you can have one on your node, but it can be one on the other. So that's something that we're working on extending. So when you do an enrich, you can specify what, how you want the resolution of that table to be. Do you want the query that runs remotely to use that local table? Or do you want to get the data in and do the enrichment locally on the port area? Yeah. All right, um, so, so only one more thing I kind of want to show, and that's just a little bit more on the um, tech side of the house. So in addition to being able to do all these wonderful aggregations, it also can be raw connect text as well. So everyone have perfectly formatted log messages? Yes, no one has this problem where someone just shows something in your system, you have no idea what it is, it makes no sense, and you can't use a keyboard for your life? Yeah, absolutely not, who would do that? All right, so real quickly, um, just to kind of show you what we're working with. So I'm going to take this out. Or, yeah, because we do that. Take out one minute. Run this. So just to show, right, the message field in and of itself is a jumble mess, right? Now, normally, when you put in something like Logic, if you need to go and fix it, you suggest you just pipelines, right? But that would mean it would need to come in this and get your index. Now, instead, you can go ahead and deal with this on the fly. So we can go ahead and bring all this back. So you can see we're keeping the message, right? Now, the limit here is a little bit different. Anyone tell me why this limit is different from all the other ones we've seen today? Order matters. Not at the end. Right. Thank you. So, yeah, so for the fact that it's not the end, it's higher. Normally, when you do the from, and the limit is at the very bottom, that means we're telling it to pull everything, right? Or we're going to use the entire data set. Instead of the limit here, we're simply saying, give me 100 results, or give me 100, right? So again, just order of matters, even though it's similar to that. Again, we're going to go to I'll make one mention, and that is, just one. depending on your query, we actually might move the limit to you. So if you look at the query here, there is no aggregation. So essentially, if you specify the limit 100 at the end, well, there is a stats, so yeah. it, it does matter. <laughs> If these stats would be here, uh, so essentially you're just streaming the data and you're saying, hey, do keep grow, keep sort, and then limit, we would be smart enough to say actually put the limit, move it here because we want to reduce data. In this case, because he's putting the limit here, essentially we're saying only get 100 because then I'm going to do a stats. So this aggregation is going to work only on 100 items. But if I put the limit here, the aggregation is going to work on all the data and the results of the aggregation are going to be limited to 100. So again, we're trying to optimize the query and be efficient if possible. But otherwise, yeah, order matters because the semantic implication of doing a limit before the aggregation after are significant. So we cannot just move it around. Yeah, yeah we'll clear enough. Yeah, it's about a year and a half on this. this you know, it didn't come across. All right. And, and so this again, Rob, that works as well. Um, and then actually, we can. So this is an example for accept and things like that. So again, this really does help with ad hoc analysis, right? Again, malform logs, you want to do something with it, you can recognize the pattern, you can go ahead and make it usable, right? And then on top, visualization is all you can save, right? So you can still do something with it, even, and then in addition, something I've talked to my customers about, you can test in just pipelines faster on the fly, right? If you can run the query, it's pretty much the same, right? You can do all the transformations, you can test, make sure everything works out, it's on the fly, you're not storing it anywhere, but again, just a small, um, copy of those of us who are uh, for those who are using lot. And lastly, this is just an example. Actually, Carlson, you want to talk to some of the uh, efficiencies on this one because you pointed out earlier. But this is just another example of something I'm using with Elastic Monitoring Data. All I'm asking for here is for it to tell me by this usage what roles are being used and what kind of this usage they have. But it's actually quite a bit smarter. So this key here is actually more or less not used. Right, so I'll just explain we're not using it in subsequent lower aggregation, we're not really going to pull it in. So we only pull in the data that's actually going to be worked on. So the system actually evaluates the query as a whole. Not a, even though we're processing it step by step, it's going to look at it holistically and say, is it actually going to be used? I'm only going to pull it in when I'm actually using it. So since I actually don't use a fair amount of this, this is more just for watching. Now, if you remove the key 
but we keep the key. Regardless, the query performs the same. So this is more just for me as I write it, so I understand what I'm actually doing logically. But again, from the query's perspective, it's just going to make it as optimized as possible. So this is more like a, almost a like a comment at this point. Um, but again, just another element of how we're optimizing classes. And that's more or less it uh, for today. So just lastly, um, a few things. As uh, Austin mentioned, there are some uh, limitations today that the team not working through. So just a few elements of this and some more aspects around you. But that's pretty much it.